the wig didn't fit good that day. <laughs> One time with the big sticks. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get those things anymore, you know? Everybody stop. You don't make them. year with Ludwig, we are now yeah, very, very proud to present Ginger Baker.
only sounds complicated because it's not. Um, okay, so now, having tried to explain, like, there were some other things there that I was doing that I didn't explain, which is using three beats of the four you're playing and use that three as a three, you know. It's, it's all threes, fours, eights, twelves. It's all that sort of thing. But really, time is four, you see. Four, the fourth dimension is in fact time. And that's what, we, what we're doing here, is playing time.
it's all very simple. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> How did you do that? <laughs> I explained that. <laughs> Nobody got any questions? Over here. Do you have any videotapes out? On instructional videotapes? No, I've been meaning to do one for a long time. <laughs> well, I will definitely buy it. I'm going to do it eventually, I promise you. All right. <laughs> Anybody else got a question? Yeah. Go on. I've, I've got one. When you do the, uh, the double bass, like uh, the alternate, like that, do you do you put your your toe, you toe it like all the time, or you go ankle to ankle? Like no, time. Toe is easier to the whole Yeah. Okay. All time. You got then. You got so many joints working. Right. You know. If you've got your heel down, you've only got three joints working. If you've got your tongue, you've got four. Okay. It's smoother. Quicker, quicker, faster. Well, it's smoother. Yeah. Anybody else got a question? Please. What would you suggest to uh, build up independence? Independence? Yeah. Okay, well, now, nobody here, or I hope. There's, there's a lot of drummers here. I hope there's some people here who have heard of Phil Seaman. Has anybody heard of Phil Seaman here? One. Phil was probably the best drummer in Europe. Unfortunately, he never got to America. But he was probably one of my biggest influences. Um, now, Phil, when asked the same question, will give you an answer, a slightly risque maybe, but <laughs> like, do everything you normally do with your right hand, with your left hand. <laughs> so, for instance, eating, cut your meat with your right hand, or, you know, eat, no, you don't do it like that here, anyway, you, you don't eat proper. But, okay, the easiest way to explain it is how Phil explained it, which is if you go to the toilet, Undo your zip with your left hand and do everything else with your left hand, right? <laughs> really, do what, what you do with your right hand, do with your left hand, and you become ambidextrous pretty quickly. It's quite easy to do, simple. That's your answer. Everything you normally do with your right hand, stop, go, I'll do it with that hand. Does that include writing? Go. Yeah. Yeah, I just think I answered that before and I said, time is four. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Um, I have done things in the past where I've played in fives and sevens and elevens. Nine doesn't really count because that's a three thing. Threes and fours. I really don't go for fives or sevens. I don't think they're uh, natural times at all. Four is the natural time. No, seven, eight, forget it. <laughs> you know, one tune in 200 million tunes in seven, eight works. All the others don't. And next, yeah. When you are when you are um, playing the fourth with your bass drum and doing some doubles off your snare and your toms and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and, you, and you were tying the time, were you consciously aware of the time, or do you have it just down so good now that you're just kind of playing up on top and leaving your bottom on automatic pilot, so to speak? My left foot is automatic pilot, basically. That's um, like you see, I base basically what I play as one unit here, as what four drummers playing in Africa, my left foot's a timekeeper. My left foot basically keeps time. Even when I'm going from the left to this, the beats are always in time, that are coming on these, this side. This side, this bit's timekeeper. And that's all it does. And then as 
the other three don't, but this one does. You've got to have one that does, preferably a foot. <laughs> Anybody else going? Yeah. I think I read somewhere that you dropped out of drumming and went to a farm or something. I dropped out of everything. <laughs> <laughs> when and why did you do that? I did that basically and mainly for my health and my existence. I had to get away from everything in order to straighten myself out. You know? Playing tracks, Ginger. Thank you. Yeah. 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 That was good. Did Cooper rehearse that right? Like, I didn't mean to ask. <laughs> what are you doing right now? Um, I'm in the midst of doing an album with the Masters of Reality that is right. happening. It's, it's a definite happening. I mean, we did 28 tracks which are not all going to be on the first album. We've done two albums, but the first one should be out sometime in the fall, please dear God. And <laughs> <laughs> that is good, very good. What's the music going to be like for Masters of Reality? Good. <laughs> yeah. Go.
that's a fucking triplet. That's a basic rudiment. And Baby Dodger was like, he, he, he sort of hit on this. All those ones that work like that, um, all the rudiments are great. If you change the beat, put them on a different beat. There's an out, a track we just done on the on the Masters thing, which is a, a parallel starting on the second beat, and it sounds incredible. You get like this, and on one. That's a parallel. It's a parallel on a different beat. Sounds cool, you know. Any more questions here? No more. Oh, I got, I got one. Go on. Yeah, uh, what did you do to your bass drum? Are they tuned up with boards there? Sorry, can you repeat? These here, um, I, what I try to do on a gig is tune my drums up to the guitars. Um, if you get, you know, like you, when they start tuning, I used to get in big trouble when I was a, like the youngest guy in the band and the guys are tuning up and I'm going, and they keep turning around and going, shut up man, we're trying to tune up. <laughs> and that's what I was trying to do. Um, <laughs> so, these here, I mean, I had, you probably, I don't know whether you know, that I had like five minutes to try and tune them up, so they're not ideal, they're not bad, but normally I do try and tune my drums in tune with the band, it sounds a lot better. Any more questions? Yeah. What do you like in today's, the new drummers nowadays? Um, Dennis Chambers, I find very impressive, very good drummer. Um, Manu Kachu, um, my well, kid too. I've got a kid who's playing frightening and stuff. Yeah. Kofi, his name is. He's pretty good. Any more questions? Go on. Is the left bass drum tuned higher than the right foot one? Is it tuned higher? On mine, in fact, it's lower. It's not lower on these. In fact, the pedal's not really happening either. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I tend to lead with the left. Well, my bass drums, I tend to lead with the left, mainly because the left foot's the timekeeper, so the left foot's always playing on the beat. So all, any patterns I play with the bass drums, the left foot's leading. Yeah. Any more questions? Go. Have you always played a double bass, or how did you start playing a double bass? No, this, <laughs> this happened when I went to see the Duke Ellington band um, early in 1966 in England. Um, I've been a big fan of Duke Ellington since I was at school. Um, and Sam Woodyard was playing with Duke in this particular time, playing two bass drums. Um, see, Duke Ellington invented two bass drums. He wasn't a drummer. But he invented it. Um, Dave Black, Louis Belson, any drummer that played with Duke Gellington played a two bass drum kit and that's where I first saw it. And Mooney was at the concert as well and I said to Mooney, I'm getting a new bass, two bass drum kit. And he said, hey man. And he turned up with his before mine because he got a premier kit and I got a Ludwig. <laughs> But I think I've got a better deal. Please. Um, do you have any plans, like, with all the reunion things going on, to do anything with... Sorry, the speak up. Do you have any plans with all the reunion things going on to do anything with, like, Eric Clapton or any of the Blind Faith Cream people at all, or any albums, tours, or anything like Not that? Not at the moment, uh, no. But Eric's not going to be working for a while. He's recovering from a pretty grotesque experience. Uh, that's not even in the question. Go. Have you ever worked for the Queen of England? Have I ever what? <laughs> 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 I think with every cap and that's what you told me. I want to do that. I work for the Queen of England. <laughs> <laughs> no way. No way. <laughs> 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 
I play polo, but I, I don't really, I'm not a terrible royalist, I'm afraid. <laughs> Oliver Cromwell's my hero. <laughs> right. Go. Ginger, what other kinds of things were you listening to other than Baby Dots where you got your acting? Well, before, before I, in fact, got the Baby Dots thing, the stuff I was listening to it when I was a kid, was Charlie Parker and of course Max Roach. Um, you know, in fact, the first record I possessed I stole, and that was the quintet of the year. Max Roach, Charlie Mingus, Buck Powell, Gillespie, and, and Bird, you know. Um, and I was very into modern jazz. Then I started playing. And I got a gig in a band playing New Orleans music, you know, what you call Dixieland, we call it traditional jazz. And that's when I got onto Baby Dance. And, and so, yeah, Max Roach was, and Phil Seaman. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, he got it from me. <laughs> I got it from Phil Seaman. <laughs> Who do you think of Ringo as a drummer? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really out of order. <laughs> <laughs> Ringo's a lovely guy. He really well, is a nice guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think he pretends to be a great drummer. I was just wondering yeah. in your professional opinion. Huh? I was just wondering in your professional opinion. You know, he does, he, he, he did his job with the Beatles fine. Yeah, yeah. It was just what they needed. It was great. It was really good. You know, he's not, not a technician or anything like that, but he plays his part right. on that sort of thing perfectly. Right. What more can you want? Any more questions? Of music well, I started off, I just told you, I was like, listening to modern jazz and I started playing traditional jazz, then got into modern jazz, but I played everything. When I was a young musician, I used to go up to Archer Street where all the musicians went and we'd play, you know, clubs with a cabaret band and uh, nightclubs, big band, dance music anything. You know, you had to be able to read music in those days. Go on. Yes, uh, do you find your knowledge if you have to play with Ray Bob or play around to the movie? Or what's the other way around? I'm sorry, what was it? When you play with Ray Bob in Air Force? Yeah. Did you get into a different feel of drumming? Do you have to adapt to them? Or? No, man. I, I, <laughs> Phil Seaman turned me on to the, Phil Seaman, I've mentioned his name quite a bit, Phil turned me on to the African thing in like 1960. Um, I finally went to Nigeria and Ghana in 1970 was the first time I went there. Um, but they all knew me before I got there. <laughs> Right, everybody, all the drummers knew me before I got there um, from what I was doing. Um, I'd already got my African influence before I went to Africa. I went there, I lived there for four years and had a great time and also got very much further into what Phil had shown me by being there. But, no, I met Fella in 1961. Fella was at the Royal School of Music in London. Uh, he played trumpet at the time and he used to come down to the all-nighters in the Flamingo and sit in with us. There, was a, there were two jazz nights there um, where I was in the rhythm section along with Tony Archer and Gordon Beck and all the horn players in town used to come down and play and the fellow was one of those. So I'd known fellow for 10 years before we did a record together. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, you've talked about mostly jazz drummers. Uh, were you influenced at all by any rock and roll or R&B drummers? Uh, well, if you've got anybody in mind. Any, I don't know. <laughs> like the late 50s, you know, late 50s and 60s or whatever. Um, American or British bands. 
that wasn't happening for you? Eh? Not really. I mean, Elvin's still around. He's still playing great drums, you know. Um, no, I was, uh, you know, the young guys coming, Dennis Chambers is definitely one that stands out for me. But too many people are playing too many beats and not really trying to say anything. A drum solo, if you're playing a solo, should be something that people can listen to. It's musical, not just a lot of technique played very fast. You know, like somebody's saying, I'm an apprentice path, and then you get something and it's like, oh, and it's not saying anything. It doesn't mean anything. It's got no, you know, only, only a drummer sitting there listening and going, oh, yeah, that was difficult to do, but everybody else has gone home. You know. <laughs> It's true. It's a musical instrument. It's like not something you just play as fast as you can. There's a lot of horn players do that as well. And like they disappear up their own jacks and all. <laughs> to me, I think I said this right at the beginning. One note in the right place can be better than 120 notes if it's not saying anything. Please. Saying that, what did you what did you think of Keith Moon as a player? Yeah, Mooney. He was a. He, Again, I think <laughs> he was a good player, he was a good drummer, but he was a better clown than he was anything. <laughs> he, was, he was a wonderful guy, he was just really, you know, he was the life and soul of everywhere he went. He was just, he was Mr. Clown, he was great. You know, everybody, if you could get a lot of long faces in a room, Mooney would walk and everybody's smiling. And he was that sort of bloke. Yeah. Did y'all ever hit the town? And do you anything really wild worth mentioning? <laughs> <laughs> well, probably. <laughs> 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 but that's that's something uh, I think is not really anybody's business but our own. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah. Yeah. Well, um, what's your preference on having your toms sort of flat on the top instead of a? Well. That, I, I've had this so many times, people have asked me this. Set your drums up how you like. I mean, <laughs> I set mine up how I like. This is how I like them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's Yeah, so I was just wondering if you would uh, talk about the differences in the recording technology of, like, say, back when you started with uh, Cream or back then. And it's a lot easier nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any differences in tuning or miking techniques or? Um, no, what I used to get, um, the, thank God I'm not getting anymore, I used to get engineers coming, well I did have it actually recently, but I won't talk about that. Um, coming around and sticking gaffer tape all over the tom toms and the snare drum and like, that's ludicrous. You know, you tune your drums up and you like the sound, what they sound like. That's what they sound like. And it's up to the engineer to get that sound, not come in here and stick bits of bloody gaffer tape all over the place. <laughs> really. <laughs> Nowadays, thank God, the engineers have started to get a lot more sus and they're getting much better drum sounds nowadays than they used to. Any more questions? Okay, so I'm going to play a bit, and I think there's a friend of mine with a bass somewhere around. Where is he? He's gone. Oh, he got bored. <laughs> <laughs>
well up you are on the history of your country. Um, but drums like this, the drum kit, was invented in America. It's something that is American, right? It's more American than apple pie, because we were having that in England, but we never had drum kits. Okay? It's American. The drums is an American thing, and I get really pissed off with like lots of American kids going out and buying Japanese drums. Now, I'm sorry, the Japs make very good cars. They can make good cars. Their Formula One engines win in all the Formula Ones. Okay, they make good cars. They don't make good drums. I'm sorry. Um, this is just not a, a personal opinion. I've tried all of their drums. Now you saw me coming here tonight, I sat down, this is a brand new kit. Okay, they're not tuned exactly perfectly how I'd like them, but they, they got pretty close pretty quick. Now if that had been a Yamaha kit, I'd still be trying to tune them. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a joke, that's an, that's an absolute fact. And I think really it's, you know, lovely drums, and I, I've been with lovely drums for 25 years now. And like they've gone through a lot of changes, but and I've had people come up to me like dealers and people, friends of mine from higher places, and they say they don't do lovely anymore because all the Japanese come and they give them ten drum kits, and lovely have got into a position now they can't afford to give them ten drum kits. So everybody you see on television is playing Yamaha or Pearl or what have you. It's up to the drummers to support people like Ludwig. Right. Buy American drums, because I'm telling you, they might, I don't even think they're cheaper anymore, but they ain't good drums. They ain't got, there's something, you know, in the, the drums in, the, in America. That nobody, it's like Rolls-Royce engines, that's one of our lot. Nobody can build cars better than Rolls-Royce and never will. And Ludwig is the same for drums as Rolls-Royce is for the cars. And really, they need all the help they can get, and that's for the sure. Okay, I'm going to play some more, but I mean, I, I mean what I said, you know?